So hello everyone, I'm Joanna. Welcome to the third of this year's Proteomics webinar series, where we're joined by two new speakers, Professor Bernard Kuster and Professor Ian Wilson, alongside our guest chair for today, Dr. Matt Lewis. Our speakers will be giving us insights into their work on the role of Microfo LC in proteomics, and Matt will then chair the question and answer session and a roundtable discussion with our speakers. Our session today is sponsored by Phenomenics, and we'll be hearing from our sponsor representative before the talks start. I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before handing over to the sponsor. So as always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussions, so please join us there to ask your questions and use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered. As we have multiple speakers, please direct your questions by naming the speakers when you type them in, as we'll be having the Q&A as a roundtable discussion at the end of both talks today. For those of you needing a certificate of attendance after this, they will be available after the webinar on the last slide. So once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. We're also grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support. Thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers. All the talks today will be available afterwards to watch again online. At, at the moment, we'd like to take this opportunity also to advertise uh, the BSPR meeting in July. Uh, and as a note to everyone, the early bird registration has just been extended until the 20th of April. So a huge thank you to our speakers and our guest chair for their time today and to Phenomenex for sponsoring the session. So I'm going to hand over to Sergio from Phenomenex now to tell us a bit about how their technology is enabling micro LC proteomic workflows. Uh, so thanks, Sergio. It's over to you. And thank you very much. And thank you for having us in the, in the presentation today. I just wanted to briefly highlight a couple of next generation materials that we're using for the extended portfolio of micro LC columns that we have at Phenomenex and the newly introduced nano LC columns uh, that we have in the portfolio. So if we look at the two materials that I wanted to highlight today, let me see, there you go. Sorry, too fast. Uh, I wanted to highlight two materials in particular. One is based on what we call Luna Omega, and the other one is kinetic. So Luna Omega is a fully porous uh, particle, uh, but it has undergone a therm thermal treatment. That means that we reduce the number of microporoses that are present in the material, and this allows to have exceptional efficiency in the, in the material that is used in the micro C columns or nano C columns. In the case of the kinetics, what this is, is a core shell material. Some of you might be familiar with this for UHPLC, for example, or HPLC, but we have extended this line to nano and micro C. So what this is, is we have a solid core in the particle that is surrounded by a porous material. So what this allows you to do is two things. First, you can be uh, more efficient in packing the material into the column. So really you diminish the A term in Van Dimter, the eddy diffusion. And then you also optimize the mass transfer coefficient in the stationary phase. So what it translates to is a sectional efficiencies in the columns, for example, without paying the price of the higher pressure. So for example, in here, if you compare a fully porous material of 1.7, so fully porous sub two micrometer particle diameter, you can obtain pretty much the same efficiency with a larger particle diameter in a core shell. Or if you were to work with the same type of particle diameter, you can significantly increase the efficiency within the same particle uh, size range. And this is an example of a nano C column. It's just to show how you can move from a fully porous, these are 20 isotopically labeled peptides, and you can see can, you can move from a fully porous material, for example, in this case, a three micrometer C18, and you can move to a core shell material. And what that allows you to do is the pressure increases proportionally to the inverse diameter to the square. So there's a little bit of an increase in pressure in here, uh, but you increase this deficiency significantly. Or on the other hand, if you move from a sub two micrometer particle diameter, to a core shell, for example, of 2.6, you can keep the same type of efficiency, but diminish the pressure or reduce the pressure 
to health. And so we have a wide variety of selectivities, obviously, and we also have different selectivities for traps because we usually like to highlight that when you work more than anything else in forward elute, be micro or nano, it's interesting to look at the best combinations of selectivities between the traps and the columns. Don't, you don't always have to have the exact same selectivity in the trap and the columns. There are benefits in working with those. So we're happy to help any of you. If you have more interest, you know, we are happy to, to, to help and, and and chat with you. And with that, thank you very much for, for having us again. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Matt, our chair, who's going to introduce um, the speakers for today, but I'll give you a quick intro on Matt first. So Matt is the head of a section of bioanalytical chemistry at the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College London. Uh, he oversees a talented and diverse team of experts responsible for the implementation of novel analytical methodology for global profiling, targeted analysis for small molecules, peptides and beyond. Their principal focus is human biofluids, tissue extracts, animal models and cell cultures needed to explore disease mechanisms in greater depth. They work closely with clinicians, epidemiologists and basic science researchers at Imperial to provide robust solutions for metabolomics, lipidomics and proteomics. So he's going to be a great chair for today's session. So I'll hand over to you now, Matt, and you can introduce the first of today's speakers. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Great. It's really my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And without any further uh, ado, I'll introduce uh, our first speaker. So our first speaker today is Professor Berhard Kuster. He studied chemistry at the University of Cologne and received a doctorate in biochemistry from the University of Oxford. Today, he's the chair of proteomics and bioanalytics at the Technical University of Munich School of Life Sciences in Friesing, Germany where he's also the uh, Vice Dean of Information Management and Director of the Bavarian Biomolecular Mass Spectrometry Center. He leads an interdisciplinary team of chemists, biologists, and bioinformaticians who are active in the field of proteomics and precision medicine with a focus on unraveling the, the molecular mechanisms at play with both cancer and the action of therapeutic drugs and seeing how he can uh, utilize those mechanisms and exploit them for treatment personalization. His team develops novel analytical methodology uh, for quantitative proteome research, including high throughput applications. Uh, we're very pleased to have him here today to talk to us about the robust, reproducible, and quantitative analysis of thousands of proteomes by Microflow LC MSMS. Over to you, Professor Kuster. Uh, I think you're on, you need to unmute. Thank you. Okay, classic uh, start. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, thanks uh, again for having me um, virtually in London um, to give a talk about our experience with Microflow LCM SMS, which uh, I must say uh, rather excites us um, here. And it has actually converted or changed the way we do proteomics in the lab quite substantially to the extent that half of all the instruments that we have now runs microflow. So this is for us not a playground. This is now the workhorse in the lab. So uh, before I get going, um, I have a few disclosures to make. I will not read them out, uh, but none of these companies has had anything to do with the science you're going to see. Okay, so uh, what the lab in general does is three things, uh, mapping out proteomes because we generally want to learn which proteins exist and where they are and in how, in which quantities and ideally how active. Uh, a second part of what we do is uh, trying to understand how drugs actually work and the third one is to build proteome tools that help us to do the other two bits better and, and the lab is actually roughly divided in um, thirds also in terms of people. Um, uh, but today I'm, I'm really going to talk about only uh, one of the technology things that we've had a lot of fun with in the last two years, which is um, our way of uh, micro LCM SMS. Um, and that goes along with sort of the the desire in the lab to, to keep developing proteomic technologies that work both at high through but at high quality at the same time. Um, so, and to go right into it, um, a few years ago, actually, I reviewed a paper of this guy, um, Juraj Lenko from the Charles University in Prague, who actually published a nice paper 
um, showing that you can do proteomics with a one millimeter column. And just to give you some perspective, the blue thing is what a one millimeter column would look like compared to the classical 75 micron column here in orange. So the, the cross-sectional area of that column is almost 200 times bigger and um, than the nano columns. And that should have a lot of uh, bad consequences for proteomics, but it actually turns out to have a lot of very good consequences uh, for proteomics. And many of you who have suffered through working with nanoscale LCs uh, for for years often, you know that this comes with a lot of issues regarding and particularly uh, robustness and also sample throughput. And doing such uh, more like almost analytical uh, scale uh, chromatography comes with a couple of benefits in particularly that you don't have to worry about your loading capacity much uh, anymore and the general chromatographic performance you have much, under much better control. And, and all of that work that you're going to see has been done by a very talented postdoc, um, Yang Yang uh, Bian, who is back in China, unfortunately now, and um, Florian Bayer, a PhD student in the lab. So, and just to illustrate um, what I mean by improved chromatographic performance, uh, this may not be very surprising, but the bottom, the top trace that you see is a total line chromatogram of, of um, um, a plasma digest, and you can see um, the hills and, and valleys and the awful peak shapes of the many very abundant uh, species that really give the separation of your nano column a hard time. And if you look at the same sample uh, run on a one millimeter column, which is only a third of the length, and it, yes, it has some other material inside it, but you can see that there are a lot of sharp peaks. And in fact, when you calculate the peak capacity, it's about 700 in 30 minutes, um, which is, is quite good chromatography, I'd say. So that um, um, paper of um, Jura Elenko gave us uh, a start here. And uh, in the following, I'm just going to whiz through a couple of the applications that and, and tests we've done to see how robust this might work in proteomics. And here's just three examples where we've separated five microgram of a CSF digest or 20 microgram of a plasma digest or five micrograms of a urine digest. And actually the numbers of proteins we get out here are quite competitive compared to what's in the literature and what is very noteworthy is um, none of those peaks is uh, tailing or saturated in any way. And what may be even uh, more interesting is that the sample to sample carryover is, is um, almost zero. And which of course is a great feature when you want to run through lots of samples um, um, in, a, in a measurement um, program. Um, and another thing that made us a bit laugh in the lab, because we actually, our way of micro LCMS works at 50 microliters a minute because it's a one millimeter column. So it's a pretty high flow. Uh, and, and one fun fact is that when you compare that directly to a 15 minute gradient on a nano system, that your high or micro flow LCMS experiment is over before the nano even starts. So you can see on the blue line is we have about 22 minutes or so lag time before the first peaks come out. And that is only two minutes. Uh, when we do direct injection on, onto that column. And of course, the immediate um, worry came up is that because the uh, cross-section of these larger columns is about 200 times bigger than that of a nano, we should have no sensitivity. But we actually do uh, still have quite a bit of sensitivity, but I don't want to hide the fact that we have about three to 10 times less sensitivity than nano LCMS. And the reason why we don't have 200 times less sensitivity is twofold the chromatographic peaks become really sharp, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. So that increases concentration, which in turn increases electrospray um, response. And then, uh, which I'm not covering here, but for about 10 years, we've been putting uh, two or 3% DMSO into our solvents that actually helps the ionization process of electrospray. Um, and that basically makes more ions from a um, given sample. So, and when we compare then uh, fractionated samples, um, in the lab that uh, we ran on, on our micro LC system, be it HeLa digest or placenta digest, uh, two or five, uh, 400 microgram of digest, and compare that to what's out there in the literature for uh, similar cell culture models and similar fractionation uh, schemes, we can actually see that the, high f uh, the microflow system performs pretty well or comparable to the nanos and both on the number of proteins and the number of peptides. And the quality of the MSMS spectra also seem to be good here. That's what you can see on this uh, in these box plots when we use Andromeda to identify the peptides. And you can see that the median scores um, 
between Nano and uh, the microflow systems are identical. Good. So um, having convinced ourselves that this was actually working, um, so we put it to a initial stress test and it needs it takes about a minute to explain what we did. So we designed an experiment that had about 1500 consecutive injections in it and we started out by running two 20, uh, 20 healer digests for uh, an hour followed by three injections of standard synthetic peptides we call Procal. Um, we generated those as retention time standards a few years back together with uh, the peptide company JPT. Uh, and we basically used this to be able to measure um, carryover after those HELAs. And then we have 20 urine samples and we have 20 CSF samples and then plasma samples from five individuals and make four injections each and then have a deep fractionated placenta digest. So all in all, that is about 155 injections and it takes four days uh, to measure and then we go around that cycle 10 times. And a couple of interesting things could be learned from that. And one was uh, the one of retention time stability. And when we plotted, when we made this plot, I could barely uh, believe this. So what we see here on the y-axis is the retention time of those Procal peptides, these synthetic peptides, when um, run alone or when spiked into the body fluids that we analyzed. And you can see from the regression line here that this is a pretty straight line. The slope is 1.00 and the intercept is less than one second. Um, and when you zoom into this area of the plot, there are three such peptides and each dot here is an individual run of, um, of a sample. And you can see that they are extremely well separated from each other, even though these two have an only uh, an illusion difference of a few seconds. And what I've already uh, said earlier is that also a very nice feature of, uh, of using bigger columns is that you can actually get most of your sample off again, uh, even if you do direct injection. So here the percentage numbers are the carryover uh, measurements from using these interspersed procal runs after HeLa or after urines or after placenta digest. So essentially we can pretty much neglect um, carryover problems. And you could also ask the question, so how quantitative uh, is this? And uh, you can see a cumulative density pro plot here where we have on the y, uh, the x-axis here, the, the coefficient of variation as measured by max quant's uh, LFQ intensities at the protein level. Admittedly, on the peptide level, it's of course going to be not quite as good, but you can see that half of all of the proteins um, are quantified with way less than 10% CV and practically all of them show less than 20% CV. And the TSNI inset here is just the data for the five individuals from whom we've run plasma. So you can very clearly see that even after running 1500 injections with all that mix of different types of samples, all of those uh, runs of these individual persons uh, are uh, nicely separated in this TSNI plot. So uh, that um, made us quite happy and, and also gave us uh, some more courage to embark on some larger projects. This is now unpublished uh, work and it's ongoing where we've, um, we are plowing through about a thousand cancer cell lines and we've done nearly 400 already. And this is what you can see in these circular plots. Each of those bars is a cell line and what we get um, is about 11,000 proteins for, for each of those cell lines. Or if we do this on the phosphorylation level, we're not quite as good as uh, nano because we actually do have less sensitivity, but still we're getting usually north of uh, 10,000 phosphopeptides uh, or phosphorylation sites per cell line. And, and the only reason why I show this this uh, cluster heat map here is uh, to show you that you actually see nothing. Um, and you have to believe me that one of those cluster tree parts is 20 HeLa QC runs that we have in there and they're all right next to each other. So the, the analytical reproducibility of um, this microflow LCMS system is just remarkable. Um, okay, so having uh, done this on one system, we quickly wanted to try it on a second and what you see in this plot is just a time axis plotted by month and how many runs uh, were done on either an HFX mass spectrometer or an Orbiter Blue Moss, and you can see that these are both these numbers have been approaching uh, 20,000 samples by the time we published the second paper on this story um, um, earlier this year. And when we look at, and this is just uh, the way how we use it, when you look at this pie chart here, uh, most of our high flow 
uh, or we keep I keep calling it high flow, but technically speaking, it's still micro flow um, that we run on the Lumos are mostly um, 15 minute gradients using high pH reverse phase fractionated samples. And another astounding um, consequence of this uh, way of doing chromatography and mass spectrometry is that the columns become extremely durable. Uh, so here, both for the two instrument setups, um, this column one has seen 14,000 um, injections. Actually, it's still on the machine. And this column two here has seen 12,000 injections when we published, and it's still on the machine. So they are good for more than 15,000 samples on a single column. And um, and of course, we've just looked at um, PEPMAP. Um, that's um, one material, but um, of course, uh, there is now a great choice of uh, stationary phases that one could could try for this. Um, again, to the word on uh, why we think robustness is there is, is shown here, perhaps a bit busy, but in 2018, in December, we ran a series of uh, different length gradients on the system. And, and what you what is plotted on the y axis is here is the, the full width at half maximum of the LC peaks. So you can see they go from any for from three seconds for 10 minute gradients up to about 10 seconds for two hours. And when we repeated exactly the same experiment um, 18 months later, the data was nearly identical. So that's also good uh, to know that one can operate these systems over a very extended period of times with very high reproducibility. Okay, I skip over that because it's not really anything new. Uh, then Yang Yang basically asked the question, so how far can we take this for a body fluid analysis in a single day if we really wanted to? And it turned out you can, if you do some fractionation, you can get to two and a half thousand plasma proteins or even 5,000 urine proteins this way. Um, not that we would um, plan to do this for every plasma or urine sample that we analyze, but it, it seems we have actually also quite some analytical depth um, in that system. Good. So um, now to work that has not been published yet, and I hope my my host is going to stop me uh, if I go over time too much. Um, but then we ask next the question, what about single shot proteome analysis? There's a lot of uh, reasons why one may want to go to single shots. It's just fire and forget and, and then have no longer to worry about uh, all the uncertainties associated with fractionation and so on and so forth. And and um, and we also thought, well, yes, we, we inject a lot more sample than in a nano system, but in many, many proteomic experiments, we actually have that. And when you come to think of it, it's when one injects 10 or 20 or even 50 microgram uh, onto uh, onto this LCMS system, this is no more than a single lane of a Western blot. So what Yang Yang then did next is to basically scale out the loading um, on such a column, going from five microgram to 150 microgram, and also using the orbit trap either at uh, 28 hertz of MSMS spectra or 41. And and what you can actually see is it doesn't always pay off to make your mass spectrometer run fast. Uh, because um, even if you can uh, acquire the spectra quickly, um, you're going to uh, have to face the fact that if you don't collect ions for long enough, then you simply don't have the sensitivity. So for most of what you're going to see in the following is we use the slower method because it gives us still more peptides and, and proteins. And what you but what you can also see is that the system seems to be saturating beyond 25 microgram of loading. And uh, we checked this out uh, if this was chromatography or mass spectrometry, and it very quickly turned out that this is not the LC system that saturates, but the mass spectrometer. So here you can see some extracted ion chromatograms of a, of a peptide, and the more you load, the chromatography people around you, uh, among you will, will know this, that it, it shifts the peak generally to earlier elution times. And you can see that its intensity really uh, saturates here, whereas the peak shapes are still fine. And then when we look at the MS1 intensity, um, of this data, we, with, which is the red line, we can actually see that the intensity on the mass spectrometer saturates. In MS2, that is not so much the case. Uh, so from that, we learned that we should really not inject much more than 25 or 50 microgram of digest onto such a system. And here's uh, another uh, sort of series of uh, busy plots, uh, but uh, one obvious thing to try um, um, one obvious thing to try when you do want to go to single shot is to extend the gradient time, but this also suffers the laws of diminishing returns. As you can see here, when again we plot the 
peak width on this axis, we go from six seconds in an hour to 24 seconds in six hour gradients. And here in the inset, we just plotted the peak capacity. Yes, it goes up over time, also quite linearly, but actually if you increase the gradient time six times, you only get about 30% uh, more or 40% more or 50% more perhaps um, peak capacity. Um, you can also take a look at uh, sort of what the gains are in terms of what you can detect in such a system. So for example, as you extend the gradient times, the mass spectrometer sees more and more and more precursors. That's the red line here, up to almost 400 things that look like peptides. And it also then is a matter of speed. Now it tries to fragment more and more and more of those. That's the black line here. But at some point it can no longer do that given the 28 Hertz method. If we run faster, as I said, we could uh, probably acquire some more MSMS. But when you then ask the question, how many of those MSMS spectra can actually be identified? The whole system goes through a, an optimum at about two or three hours. And after that, it goes down. And the simple fact is then, even though we have all these precursors in MS1, we don't collect enough ions to uh, identify them. And that is illustrated on the right-hand side of the plot when we look at here the precursor ion intensity of peptides that we either identify or don't identify across the gradient times. You can see that the gap between the blue and the red box plots becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's sort of a minimum uh, intensity that a precursor has to have in order to be able to identify it down the road. So this is a pure sensitivity issue in MS2 um, that leads to this fact that although we collect more and more MSMS spectra, we actually get less and less in return. Good. So uh, this is um, unfortunately also a busy slide, but an important one. Um, again, with the idea of getting most out of single shot LCMSMS data, we've then married the uh, data acquisition with an, a machine learning tool that we've developed, which is called Prosit, essentially, which is a uh, is an IT tool that has learned to predict what MSMS spectra of peptides should look like. And we trained that on hundreds of thousands of synthetic peptides where we know exactly um, which peptide sequences we put into the mass spectrometer and then basically feed a computer or a neural network with this information to learn the relative intensities and the absence and presence of BNY ions in any of those peptides. And we can use that to predict any uh, spectrum for any peptide sequence, but we can of course also use it to check if a search engine has identified the right thing. And this is what is plotted here. So on the left hand side, this is all on the peptide level and this is all on the on the protein level. Again, now looking at LCMS experiments from one hour to six hours and either only looking at max quant results or Prosit rescored max quant results. And you can see here is when we start out with a one hour gradient of max quant results, we get about 38,000 peptides. And then when we throw Prosit at it, it thinks that about 3,000 of those peptides are just actually wrong, but it find, finds 5,000 other ones uh, that it thinks is are better. And then you, when you look across here, the blue, ex, uh, the blue bar here is the losses by Prosit rescoring are roughly constant as we go across the gradient time and and the more the longer uh, LCMS you do, the more peptides you get. So essentially what Prosit is doing, it, it identifies weaker MS2 spectra that didn't pass an FDR or identification threshold of max quant. The same can be done on the peptide level. Um, and, and then we ask the question, so where where does this take us in, in single shot? And uh, so Yang Yang, uh, looked at digests of uh, of a plant, uh, root digest, human breast cancer cell lines, the mouse uh, small intestine sample, and mouse thymus, and and the story is always the same. Either if you use two or three hour LCMS gradients, we get about 60, 70 thousand peptides, and on the right hand side you have the same numbers for proteins. So and currently the the, the record in the lab is on this Arabidopsis sample is that we get almost 9 thousand proteins in a single shot three hour LCMS experiment. Um, and that compares quite favorably to data that we've uh, sneaked from uh, Josh Kuhn, who did nano uh, in combination with FAMES as a separation, gas phase separation technique on, on a different sample. So it's hard to compare these directly, but it seems that the microflow LCMS system single shots um, are quite competitive. As I said, this has really transformed the way my, my lab is working. We have three such systems now. Uh, converted to this um, uh, and running pretty much flat out anything that isn't modifications or scarce 
uh, samples. Here's a different way of again looking at the quantitative accuracy because we ran some replicates. Also on this uh, tissue level, we can get CVs of less than 20%, not for all of the proteins, but for the majority of them. And what is also, I think, quite interesting when we look at now this distribution plot here, which plots out um, protein in uh, quantity as measured by this IBEC approach, we can see that we get about five to six orders of magnitude dynamic range in all of those different tissues. And again, this is not very different from even a fractionated sample um, doing uh, done by nano. So last data slide and uh, just an outlook uh, and that is a manuscript we are only preparing. I haven't shown this to anyone yet. Um, so the next step for us is to try out DIA and, and for me that's a big step to make because uh, I frequently voiced my concern about DIAs mainly because we don't quite know what we measure, uh, but we're finally going there to see if a single shot analysis um, and DIA is a good combination. And the long story in short is, uh, it's actually gratifying to see that DIA, DDA and DIA are moving closer to each other when we look at this. Um, but DIA of course uh, heavily rec uh, relies on having good libraries against which you, you search your data. And that is what is shown here on, on the right hand side. Again, lots of data here and these are each of those plots is a Venn diagram comparing the results of spectral out analysis direct DIA of a sample that has six and a half thousand proteins in it to running that DIA sample against the library that was made from a single shot DDA, one single shot DDA of the same sample. And we can actually see that most of those proteins are the same. We lose some because the library might not be very comprehensive. So we made another library that looked at 10 replicates of a, the same sample shot by DDA and that increases the overlap, but we still lose things. So you may start wondering why that is. We can also play our prosit trick then again on the on the library so that to, to enhance them. And uh, so the, the one in the red box is actually the winner. So if we use a DIA library that's constructed from 10 runs of DDA of the same sample, this is actually where, which gives us the best result. And interestingly, and this is something I would like the DIA community to think about it more, is whatever we do in terms of uh, fractionation, be it in the gas phase or be it by chromatography or also using the same amount of sample or using more amount of samples, we never, never find all of the peptides and proteins back that we had in single shot analysis. So I conclude from this, they are simply not there in the sample when you run it by DIA. So um, that's uh, where all of this stands and um, brings me to the end of my talk uh, and of course I have to thank a fantastic team of uh, people with whom I have the pleasure to work every day. Well these days only half of them every day because the other half is in home office and I hope I've not been whizzing through this too quickly and I'm happy to take questions um, after the second talk. I think that's um, the understanding that we have that all the questions are going to be asked uh, at the end of both talks. So thank you very much. Super, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as uh, as Pro Professor Kuster said, we'll take questions after the second talk. So um, with that said, I'd like to move on to our second speaker, uh, Professor Ian Wilson. I'll introduce him briefly. He studied biochemistry at the University of Manchester uh, and received his doctorate on insect molting hormones at Keele University. Uh, Professor Wilson has a long and illustrious career in the pharmaceutical industry, most recently as senior, uh, senior principal scientist in the Department of Drug Metabolism and Pharmacokinetics at AstraZeneca. Uh, interestingly and anecdotally, the first time I think I met Ian, uh, we were at AstraZeneca, he was propping open the back door as we wheeled out a number of mass spectrometry instruments uh, into an unmarked van that I later drove off. So not coincidentally, he joined Imperial College in 2012, where he now holds the chair in drug metabolism and molecular toxicology. His research is directed towards the development and application of hyphenated techniques to the study of drug metabolism, toxicology, and metabolism. Uh, 
uh, endogenous human metabolism. I've also had the great pleasure of working with Ian over the last eight years and am therefore quite familiar with his microfill uh, LC work as applied to metabolomics. So naturally, I'm very pleased and interested to have him here today guiding us, as he would say, into the darkness uh, as a metabolomicist dipping a spoon into the soup of proteomics. With that, over to you, Ian. Right, OK. Um, my talk is, as you can see, well, as you will see when I'm able to move the thing forward, uh, whilst I think I requested. Hey, you okay. try just try just clicking the screen with your mouse and then yes. using the key, and then using the keyboard. Yeah. I will do that. Thank you. So let's see what happens when I do that. Ex absolutely excellent. One of the things you will have worked out by looking at the screen is that with hair this color, I am completely incompetent with computers and I certainly loathe. Um, I certainly loathe Zoom and all its descendants, but that that's me and that's my problem. So my desk is somewhere behind there and one of these days I will get back to Imperial and won't that be nice. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to talk to you about why I am the wrong person to be giving this talk. Um, the main reason is that I'm not a proteomicist. So if you like anything uh, that you hear, it was done by these people, a mixture of people at Manchester and Waters. And if you don't like anything I say, it was done by these people, uh, Waters and Manchester, and I'll give you their email addresses if you ask me and you can tell them what you didn't like. Um, so why am I speaking to you at all, especially after that outstanding talk by Professor Kusta? Um, well, these, I call it an outline, but they're almost axioms. I would say to you, and you know better than I, that conventional proteomics by Nanoflow LCMS doesn't really lend itself to high throughput. In the areas that I like to think I'm working, which is drug discovery, a little bit of human disease and epidemiology, all of these could benefit from rapid and high throughput screening approaches. And at the moment, I'd suggest to you that apart from the work being <laughs> that was highlighted in the previous talk, it doesn't do that yet. Now, the other thing I want to make very clear is that high throughput does not mean doing away with in-depth profiling. It's about screening. But what it does do is it may help you to identify those samples that it's worth investing a lot of time in. So it's an enabler for hypothesis generation, not a replacement for very high resolution methods. So what does an ignorant, and I do mean ignorant, metabolomicist or metabolomicist, is what, which is what I consider myself to be, have to say about proteomics? So my first exposure to proteomics was in 2006. And yes, this is a 2D gel. And I quite like 2D gels. Um, you combine two separations, you can see what's happened. Um, you also are looking at the intact proteins um, and you can see where some of those proteins have been modified and which proteins have been modified. It's quite interesting. And that is why we never did any more because actually it takes a long time. It requires a great deal of skill. And although you can run lots of gels in parallel, it's still not high throughput. And again, I'd like to give you some axioms you know, we're doing omics. We're not doing it for fun, although it is fun. It's about as much fun as you can have in a laboratory that's still strictly legal. But we are doing it to understand systems, including patients. And we're doing it to make a difference. And to understand these systems, I and the rest of us really need to have access to all the levels of biomolecular organization, the genome, transcriptome, proteome and metabolome to be able to pin it all back together and try and work out what's happening. Now, again, with hair this colour, what that means is you don't have unlimited time 
to to look at this and you certainly don't have unlimited resource to do what you might consider would be one way of increasing throughput which is to buy more mass spectrometers and lc systems and run them side by side in multi-parallel processing that in many ways is going back to gels now i didn't stop with gels in about 2013 2014 we had a look at what i'm calling conventional proteomics so we looked at a, a mouse model and this is a very interesting mouse model it's called the hepatic reductase null mouse and as a result of uh, having pore knocked out in the hepatocytes it has no functional liver p450s so it can't metabolize drugs and if you want to know whether your compound of interest is metabolizing drugs in the liver and only the liver or in the liver and the kidney and the uh, and the gut if you can knock out the liver you can see what's going on in other places so we were doing what i think you would probably consider to be conventional proteomics um, we were using ice long uh, columns 75 micrometers internal diameter and 90 minute gradients and three technical replicates per sample And if you do that, you can generate some really nice data and really quite instructive data. So the wild type mice that have fully uh, competent livers are in green on the left hand PCA, principal component analysis uh, score plot. And the HRN mice, which are clearly different in terms of their liver proteins um, down here are the pink dots. So that's good. And if we move over to the volcano plot, you can see that there's quite a lot going on in the HRN mouse. And these numbers probably mean something to you. To me, they're just differences. But what is really nice is that you can identify them. And the wild type mice have differences which are unique to them as well. So proteomics here is giving me some nice answers. But, and there's always a but. You know, the data are great, it's really informative, and they've allowed us to construct a nice narrative that builds bridges between the metabolomic study that we'd already done. Uh, and there's a reference to that at the bottom. Uh, but we're obtaining the proteomic data on a very small number of samples, nine in total. So they were analyzed in triplicate and it was time consuming so yeah about two days for 10 samples the way we were doing it now obviously if you don't have very many samples this is affordable in terms of resource and and effort but if you have 500 well you know not so much to put it into context i can do 500 samples by metabolomic profiling probably in one two days max um, i haven't bothered to do the maths but i'll leave that to you 500 times uh, one and a half hours is a lot longer than two days so i'd say to you that higher throughput is absolutely essential if you're going to bring proteomics into the clinic and um, even more so into a clinical analysis laboratory rather than a specialist proteomics lab we've got to make it higher throughput and we've got to make it very robust now the data you saw in the previous presentation showed you just how robust it can be um, we, we have nowhere near that amount of beautiful data um, on the other hand i can blame that on the fact that i don't have such a large and talented group but that would just be me uh, moaning so let's stop moaning and look at the experiments that we've done so we're going to look at proteomics on a one millimeter uh, scale with a hundred millimeter column. It's a water special uh, peptide CSH column, C18, 130 angstrom pore size, 1.7 micron. And we're comparing it to two standard formats, a 300 micrometer and a 75 micrometer format. 
And what we've tried to do is to loot all these things at their optimum flow rates with the same gradient, the same mobile phase, looking at the same samples. And the samples that we've looked at are E. coli digests, control human plasma, and what we're calling phenotypic pools of control and prostate cancer patients, and I'll get to those later. So some of this is already familiar from the previous talk. So this is a, what I'm calling a peptidogram, which I am sure will offend quite a lot of proteomicists, but may at least keep your attention. It's a serum, it's on a 75 micron column, and we've got an analysis of around 9,500 minutes. And as the previous speaker rather more eloquently said, you aren't getting 95 minutes worth of analysis because it takes about 25 minutes for the sample, you know, for the wheels on the sample to hit the tarmac and actually start generating data. But isn't it beautiful data? I mean, look at those peaks. If you're a separation scientist, that's the nearest thing to nerdvana that I can think of. And even better, you've got time to go and get a coffee beforehand. All right, you can go faster. Here's a 300 micron column. Um, and here we've got a one hour run. Um, haven't got time for coffee, maybe time to answer the phone. So, you know, in terms of using machine time efficiently, this is quite good, but it's still an hour per sample. All right, here's the one millimeter column and we're actually aiming for sub 20 minute analysis time, um, 15 or so minutes gradient. And the nice thing about this is that there's an awful lot of peaks crammed into a small area. You could almost fool yourself into thinking that it's like the 75 micron column. You would be wrong, but it is very nice chromatography. You're getting peaks that are two, three seconds wide which is hmm, actually worth having. OK, so where do we go from here? This looks interesting. It's six times faster than the 75 micron column. What have we lost? What have we got? What have we gained? Let's start looking at the peaks. All right, so here's three peptides that are looting from the column uh, between sort of five minutes and 15. Um, beautifully symmetrical peak widths of about uh, two, three seconds at half height. So that's very nice. Uh, of course, it does, whilst not posing a problem for the chromatography, does rather pose a potential problem for the mass spectrometer. And that is just exactly how well are those peaks defined? So let's ask that question. So here we are looking at the same peak across all three scales of chromatography. So if you look on the far left, you can see the 75 micron column. Uh, at a 0.5 second scan rate, and we get easily 20 points across the peak. When we go to the 300 micrometer column, peaks are okay, and we're still getting, uh, using the same scan rate, 20 points across the peak. When we go down to the one millimeter scale, okay, we have to use a faster scan rate, and we're only getting 10 points, but that should still be enough to define the peak reasonably well. So what happens when we analyze the data? OK, if we go to the bar graphs here, we have a sample of E. coli proteins and their associated identified peptides at all three scales from one millimeter here to 75 micron here, um, and some of the protein identifications on this scale. So, you know, first thing to say is 75 micron gives you more coverage. It's over a thousand um, proteins. Um, but look, the one millimeter and 300 micrometer, 
they're not so very different. If we go down to the peptide in identifications, well, again, as you would expect, the higher resolution 75 micro, micrometer column gives a better result. And the one millimeter column gives a significantly inferior result, but it's still pretty good. And if you look at the sequence coverage across the three scales, well, again, 75 micron is better. But, you know, one millimeter, 300 micron, meter they're not so very different i'm very happy with this especially as it's four times faster than that and six times faster than this now again if we look at these e coli proteins and say okay what do we lose so all three platforms hoover up about 730 proteins the 75 micron column uniquely identifies a further 108. 300 micron uniquely identifies 29. Well, you can read the numbers as well as I can, especially if I don't cover them up with the mouse. So they're not giving you exactly the same answer, but they are giving you what I would call an exactly similar answer. Can they tell the difference between different patient groups? It's an interesting question. So what we did, we took some samples from patients with prostate cancer and different treatments in a large number of groups. And rather than analyzing every single sample, we made what we called what we call phenotypic pools. And these are shown sort of here. So here are the treatments. We've got QCs, which are basically all of this lot mixed together. We have controls, which is people with no known disease. Then subjects who've been given hormone and radiotherapy, uh, some species of prior treatment, they're being given nothing, but they're being watched very carefully and very closely. Uh, brachytherapy, uh, hormone treatment and prostatectomy. If we go over to A, um, we're looking at triplicate injections or thereabouts. Actually, it's slightly more than that. I think we I think we used five. But whatever, you can see that the groups are reasonably well distinguished. Five and six are rather close here. Uh, eight's over here. You know, again, if you really want to stare at this, you can. It's easier to see in the paper, I think. If we remove the QCs, again, we get slightly less good resolution between the groups, but you can see that uh, prostatectomy has a radical difference to many of the other treatments, and so does hormone and radiotherapy. Um, you know, it's interesting. You can see that there are things in these samples that are worth finding. And having looked at a sort of a gestalt sample for these, these groups, you can now go back in to those samples and either with again with a high throughput method analyze every single sample or say all right i now want to analyze these groups of samples with a very high resolution method so in this screening mode what you've been able to do is rack through a lot of samples very quickly now if we move on uh, this is the summary if you like so in favor of all of this, I think the one millimeter proteomics is practical, is readily implemented. And I think based on the evidence that we have gathered from our own work, provides a fit for purpose, i.e. not the best, but the quickest method for high throughput um, analysis or screening. The other beauty of it is it doesn't require any specialist equipment. So it puts the proteomics into the hands of the non-specialist. So it democratizes it. You don't need to be a specialist proteomicist. You can be like me, completely ignorant and still get in there. Um, you know, the other thing is, it's the same equipment that you're using to do metabolomics or anything else. So you can do metabolomics in the morning and proteomics in the afternoon. 
just change the column and the chromatography. And to reiterate, none of this stops you doing in depth profiling if you need to. Against it, well, the only thing I've come up with for the moment, and this is a joke, by the way, is it gives you less time for coffee, which is probably not a good reason for coming up with anti. And so just to state the obvious, you've already seen an incredibly uh, impressive lecture. Um, you've heard now the one that I'm giving, which is somewhat less impressive. And we're not the only people who are looking at these areas. So here's a couple of five minute methods. And here's the 30 second, uh, 30 second methods also been described. And if you read this article, which is, I think, just appeared in the um, American Society for Mass Spectrometry Journal, um, now is the time. But to achieve this, I would suggest to you that proteomics does have to be democratized, taken from the research lab and put into the hands of people like me, or actually preferably people not like me, people who actually understand what they're doing. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope some of that was interesting. Super, thank you very much, Ian. Um, I think we will now, in the last uh, 15 minutes to half an hour, open up for a hybrid Q&A session and discussion. So I've been keeping an eye on the questions coming into Slack. Uh, and if no one wants to jump in right away, which I really encourage you all to do, we can start from there. So um, would anyone like to kick off? Otherwise, I will start to read off questions. Okay, All right. Uh, OK, OK, uh, so let's see. Uh, Dr. Harry Whitwell asks, do you still use a trap column ahead of your one millimeter column? So if you're doing microflow, are you still trapping? I think so that was a question. Yes, please. Yeah, that's Bernard speaking. Uh, we don't. We do direct injection, and okay. that comes at a cost, of course. But uh, if the upstream sample prep is well under control, we haven't lost a column for blocking yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think a, a question initially for Berhard, but also uh, I think somewhat answered by by uh, Ian. Do you find any issues with your better chromatography for getting sufficient data points per peak? I think Ian did discuss that. Um, and Berhard, I think you did discuss a bit, but there's a question specifically around uh, for, for DIA analysis. Yeah, I can say something about that. DIA is, of course, a problem. Mm. And uh, DIA mm. works the better the poorer the chromatography is and but that is one of the many issues i have with dia i, I as an analytically <laughs> trained person i i don't want to give up one of my most important separation techniques yeah. for uh, an unclear benefit so yeah so dia isn't a natural fit to sharp peaks on chromatography yeah. <laughs> this is why we tend to not do it my last slide was going to at least sort of our mission is to make that difference between dia and dda go away that would be the best uh, in our opinion the best course of action and i think i'd like to agree with that i mean i don't think that um the fact the instrument can't cope is a good excuse. I think that's a challenge to the manufacturers to make better instruments. So, so with that in mind, I, I think that's that's an excellent point. What what would you like to see from instrument manufacturers? Um, because I, it seems to me, and and I'll, I'll ask a follow up question on this, but it seems to me that the field is 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 going in a in a in a in a little bit different direction than it did in the past. What would you ask of your instrument manufacturers to help you on your journey now? Well, if I go first, I'd still have the same, the same as always. 
speed, sensitivity, mass accuracy, all the parameters, at least as long as you want to use a mass spectrometer, um, <laughs> all of the parameters are kind of still the same. Um, and and But in particular, the sensitivity is an issue uh, because our ability to write spectra quickly to disk uh, is one thing. Uh, and at some point in the, in the not so uh, distant past, that was actually a problem, being able to write down data to disk mm. quick enough, right. but that is no longer a problem. But uh, there's also no point in writing empty spectra to disk. So sensitivity remains an issue. And there's a, again, uh, uh, because we've touched on DIA, there's a common misconception that DIA is more sensitive. That's not the case. It's actually mm. less sensitive. You're collecting fewer, I you fewer ions in your MS2 spectra. Not more ions, you collect fewer ions. Mm -hmm. So um, basically speed and sensitivity always go together no matter how you measure. DDA, DIA, it doesn't matter. If you want more speed, you've got to have more sensitivity. Otherwise, your speed doesn't buy you anything. Mm. I see. Ian, any uh, comment? Yeah, I would suggest that for both metabolomics and for high speed separations and proteomics, one of the biggest problems is still ion suppression because that kills the, or can kill the minor peaks. It may be less of a problem in proteomics, but I, I still think it probably is a problem now. One of the, the things that really limits how fast you can go is iron suppression, I think. Mm -hmm. So if, if that could be eliminated, it would be absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm sure there are very many clever people all over the world trying to fix that one. <laughs> I'd agree with that. OK, thank you. Thank you both. I think uh, a follow up question and Harry's uh, actually asked it on the on the chat right now, but uh, this educate me and perhaps others on the group. I mean, I, I come at uh, the field mostly from a small molecule background where we've been working at higher, uh, larger column inner diameters, higher flow rates, and uh, seeing very good precision for a long time. And my perception of the more modern proteomics field has been that they're working at the cutting edge of what is possible from nanoflow systems. But both talks today are about walking things back, uh, walking them back a little bit for the sake of maybe sacrificing some sensitivity and sacrificing some of the promise of fully comprehensive coverage, but you're gaining other things. And, and so, I, I mean, why did the field not develop in that way in the first place? Why did it not start at the most precise and most robust and then chase the diminishing returns of coverage? Why is it going coverage first and now is pulling back? Does it have to do with applications, technology? What would you think? Yeah, so I've, I've watched quite a bit of that time. And um, in a way, some people actually started that way because the commercial LCMS equipment in the early days was simply analytical <laughs> scale. So um, the early papers also of the groups of John Yates and the likes, they've actually used more like analytical flow, okay. but they, they ran into sensitivity issues. And and the other end of the stick was the development of Matthias um, Wilm coming up with this idea of nano spray without any LC separation. And that was so amazingly sensitive at a flow rate of 10 or 20 nanoliters a minute that you could actually do away with ion suppression problems. You could ionize everything that was in that little drop. And if you could get your sample from your biochemistry work into that 20 nanoliters of a liquid, you could spray that for minutes or many minutes. So it, you had exquisite sensitivity, which is why the nanoscale system took off. Um, and as all of those systems became more sensitive, the swing back has started a few years ago. People have gone from 75 to 300 micron and, and the mass spectrometers had become much more sensitive to compensate for some of that loss. I mean, okay, some of us have tried additives to the solvents to boost the electrospray response that has worked um, uh, to some degree and making peaks sharper again has increased concentration and because the electrospray is concentration dependent has again helped. So uh, it's sort of the natural cause of uh, events where sensitivity had been so limiting that people were forced to go nano or slower um, and now that some of these sensitivity issues have been overcome, um, other more traditional technologies come back. Mm. If I can make a comment, Matt, I think there's also something philosophical as well. The, the people 
doing the genome, we're able to map the whole damn genome, which is really impressive. Um, and I think that set an ambition in both proteomics and metabolomics that they wanted to provide a complete map. So you could say that that's mapping the genome, mapping the proteome, mapping the metabolome. Now in metabolomics, which is the only area I can really talk about, we very soon lost that ambition because just identifying what we could see was so complicated. And we came back to the, OK, well, we've got a technology we can use to look at disease, to look at things like that. And we want biomarkers. So we didn't want to map anymore. It wasn't the number of peaks we could see that mattered. It was the number of peaks that mattered that was important. Uh, and that caused us to refocus on faster methods and just not trying to measure everything, just trying to find a few things that could say, you know what, you've got disease X and we'll give you this drug and you will live. But if we give you this drug, ah, not so good. You know, that's that's been the aim. So it's it's refocused. And I think maybe some of that is hitting proteomics. You know, we've got this great technology. What can we use it for? It, that, that's a feeling anyway. It's certainly, I think, the way the metabolomics developed. Yeah, just to add to that, in metabolomics, it was more pressing to go this way because of the identification issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and oh, then yeah. once you've found something, it's better than to focus all your time and attention on that, on these few things you really care about. Whereas in proteomics, at least there is still the, well, the, the, the identification problem isn't nearly as bad. Yeah. So which basically uh, yeah. keeps people on their toes to try and map lots yeah. at yeah. the same time. And you're also very lucky that you can map directly back onto the genome. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. you know, if, if you look at, the, you know, the proteome and the genome are connected like that. Show me where the metabolome connects to either. It's very much more complicated. So if you're trying to build systems biology, proteome to genome, genome to proteome, that works. Metabolome, that requires a lot more, a lot more beer to work out what's going on. So it does seem like the pressures of, of clinical translation anyway are honing the focus of omics towards more definable outputs, even if they're less overall than was originally envisioned in comprehensive measurement. At least now you're delivering sets of hundreds or low numbers of thousands of, of specific markers. Is that, okay, thank you both for that really comprehensive uh, answer. There's, there's a question here for Ian. Uh, do you find that metabolomic samples don't impact at all on your proteomic sensitivity in the MS if you switch? Yeah, so the question is, how wise is it really to switch between applications? You could, you mentioned you could, but is it a yeah. smart thing to do? Well, I don't see why it shouldn't be. I mean, if you clean the machine properly, um, it shouldn't be a problem at all. But I suppose where I was thinking here, you know, many of us are lucky to work in facilities with all the equipment that you can you can possibly want. But the vast majority of people working in this area do not have an infinite number of mass spectrometers. So they do have to use the same machine multiply, especially if they've got six graduate students all who need time on it. Now, I am ve I'll be very honest with you, I have not tried doing the experiment of proteomics in the morning and um, metabolomics in the afternoon. That's because I'm not competent with instruments. I mean, <laughs> if people see me walking towards an instrument with a screwdriver, you know, the, the net comes out. But somebody ought to try it, let me know. I will bet a small bottle of a reasonable malt whiskey that it will work fine. <laughs> Good, thank you. For for Professor Kuster, we, uh, sort of a, a derivative question and specific in this case to use of DMSO. Uh, with DMSO in large quantity of peptides injected, how often do you need to stop and clean instruments, uh, including further down in the quad? I mean, you're talking about 15, I think you said 15,000 injections. Um, what's the actual practical situation look like there at the at the coal face of the instrument? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we find this is actually not much related to DMSO at all, at least on our Ovitrap instruments. So we had mm -hmm. one report uh, from 
a colleague in Canada who tried DMSO um, on an Agilent machine with an iron funnel and he saw a jump in sensitivity for about one minute and then it was going down until he had no <laughs> irons anymore. And, and apparently the reason for that was that the source region wasn't operated at a very high temperature and DMSO of course has a very high boiling point of something like 230 degrees. Um, so, but on the orbit traps and also on the Brooker machines, there is a very hot surface, um, um, hot area in the in the source region, and we operate our capillaries at about 300 degrees, and that burns it all away. So, um, for most instruments, there shouldn't be a problem, and we've been we've been literally doing this on all of our instruments for the past eight years, and we've not ever had a breakdown because of DMSO. In fact, some of the more modern ion sources may not need that so much anymore, but we still keep using it because it's a strong solvent as well, and it keeps our LC clean. All right. I hope everybody heard that because the, the feedback like that is is something that you just can't get anywhere anywhere. Oh, and and tech research technicians of companies are told to tell their customers don't use DMSO because it yeah. kills your instrument. And we operate seven orbit traps all under DMSO, and we've done this for nearly ten years. Uh, do I have the resources to buy? Uh, machines all the time or bring in technicians all the time? No, but it's a fact that, um, and it actually now another sort of uh, dirty little secret is the, the LUMOS instruments need a lot less cleaning than the um, quadrupole orbit trap instruments. And nobody really understands this. We also don't understand it. So the LUMOS, our, we clean our LUMOS instruments, including the quad, about once in three months. And and that time is probably once in six weeks or eight weeks for the QE type instruments of the latest generation. The HFX needs cleaning at about six to eight weeks at high flow. Actually, the higher flow rates help you here as well. Um, the, the downside of having high flow is that you don't ionize everything. The upshot of nano is that you ionize almost everything, also all the things you don't want. Yeah. So there's a lot of iron current going into your nano system that that you really don't want to be there and and seasoned uh, technicians from the vendors know that actually nanosystems generally tend to get more dirty more quickly than the micro or analytical flow systems simply because you don't ionize everything okay all right i think to to probe you a little further on the longevity of the chromatographic performance if if you're injecting 15000 consecutive injections you say it's working well but are you how are you judging that is it in terms of the overall precision obtained or are you really looking at analytical factors like pk symmetry and saying yeah this the stationary phase is still performing up to spec yeah, so we have um, a, a number of QC samples that we run all the time. Some of them are spiked in, like, like these procal peptides. They are in every sample, so you get, you can look at that uh, all the time. We, like many other labs, have um, some HeLa digest that we inject very regularly, uh, and then we look at things like chromatographic peak width, intensity distributions, numbers of peptides that we get out, uh, things like this. Um, so that's basically the, the most important of our mm -hmm. measures. And if if we drop below a rather arbitrary but lab learned value in any of those, we know it's time to do something. I see. So so a, so a bit of analytical characterization, but heavier on the functional output of the of the system for quality. Yes. So I mean, Ian said it before. Um, one one uh, principle we operate by is also is the system fit for purpose. Mm. There, there's no point in sort of tweaking out the last percent of performance if you never need that. Um. Yeah. So when it comes down to designing systems, now we've we've talked about uh, we've talked about evolution through through nanoscale. Some people starting at microflow. Now more of the field coming back to microflow. If you are pursuing an optimized methodology, uh, I think that the definition of optimal will probably depend for different people based on the different weights that they put on characteristics, cost, throughput, comprehensive coverage, etc. How would you define an optimal setup today? What, In terms of ranking, let's say, uh, ranking, what did we say, cost, throughput, coverage, data quality, maybe those four parameters. And do you think that, that that those rankings will change in the future and will they change how people think of proteomics platforms going forward? 
Yeah, so I mean, the fit for purpose idea has been has been covered. So I think that's a generally good principle to follow. Mm -hmm. um, if it's good enough, then don't worry too much about it. I think the next big point for Proteomics is what Ian described as democratizing it. So getting it simpler is is good. And and again, these higher flow LCMS systems have have that have that going for them. You can give that into the hands of less experienced people. And also in my lab where we only have PhD students and postdocs also to maintain and run the instruments, those who run the microflow systems have a lot less to do than the ones that run the nano systems. So, and if you project that towards, let's say, a, a really a, a facility or even a clinical chemistry department, yeah. um, that part to me is the next thing that is going to enable that transition to make it simpler. Um, and beyond that, it, I think it very quickly becomes a question of the application and, and what the requirements for the applications are. Yeah, and I have to say that I agree with that absolutely completely. What, what you need, what you want to do defines how you do it. I think that's a that's that's a fair answer. I hadn't expected any anything more specific. So thank you. <laughs> uh, we have we're almost out of time. So I just want to get to a couple like very very short uh, specific questions that people have raised here. Um, so has anyone tried solid fabricated columns, uh, micro pack columns? We did. Yeah. And uh, did you get similar performance, better or worse? No, maybe we just got unlucky. It broke after 10 injections and that was the end of our trials. OK, <laughs> but that may be just too anecdotal to really uh, to be taken as a firm opinion. Fine, thank you. Um, to either of you, have, uh, running DMSO, any r impact on reducing the lifespan of the column? No, the contrary. It cleans it out. You can run these things in 100% DMSO, no problem. <laughs> yeah. OK. No, the only real problem with running very high solvent systems of DMSO is DMSO is a really good paint stripper. Yeah. <laughs> so if you spill it on your LC, it doesn't look quite as nice as it did before you spilt it. And it gets smelly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, hardware is completely fine, generally, other than yeah, the paint and stuff. So it's the chromatography people tell us in within thermo you can run these systems in 100 percent uh, dmso it will not it will not dissolve your system okay. great thank you one one last question uh have you tested the peptide id efficiency of microflow lcms ms coupled to online 2d separation techniques well, I guess that depends whether you consider iron mobility to be a 2D separation when you have it in between your column and your mass spectrometer. And I have to say that I do. I mean, I, if I wasn't talking too much in my talk, I would have mentioned this, that the 2D gel has got uh, a separation that's sort of chromatographic and a separation that's electrophoretic. And if you have a 2D separation, it takes a long time. Now, if you throw iron mobility in, you don't get many theoretical plates, but you do get a totally orthogonal separation, mm. which has the advantage of cleaning up your, your samples because it separates some of your co-eluting peptides as they flow through the iron mobility cell. That's the only 2D sort of chromatography, it's a, it's a 2D separation I ever want to do mm. because 2D columns, they are a whole field of pain in terms of column switching and all that sort of stuff. It, you just, and then the data integration after you've done it, you just, you just don't want to go there, in my view. <laughs> there you go. Anything to add to that before we wrap up? Well, well, chromatography wise, when we do 2D LC, we do it offline to avoid some of those technical issues. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have um, looked at FAMES very carefully, uh, like others have too. and. It doesn't quite provide the separation power than LC chromatography, uh, LC-based systems do. But of course, uh, if you have the time in the measurement to do it, there's no harm in doing it, and you, and you do get extra. Mm. Clearly, fantastic, really fascinating. Thank you both for wonderful, enlightening uh, presentations. I've certainly learned a great deal here. Um, there's still a lot of unanswered questions, so I would uh, hopefully. I'm not overstepping my bounds by saying do get in touch with these people. They're both very nice and I'm sure they'd love to chat about the science they do. So um, I'm not sure how to conclude, but I think I'll turn it back over to the organizers. Thanks for the discussion. 
Thanks, Matt. That was great. Yeah, um, perhaps uh, if uh, Ian and Bernard have time, they can go on the Slack channel afterwards and uh, have a look at the uh, overwhelming number of questions that came in for today's uh, webinar. Obviously, there's a huge interest. And if there's any of the unanswered questions, then uh, it'd be great if you guys could add a couple of answers to those. Um, so, yes, in in conclusion, yeah, we'd obviously like to uh, thank both of our speakers uh, for today and uh, Matt for hosting a really excellent uh, discussion session, super interesting. And thanks to our sponsors, Phenomenex, and for those committee members who are working away in the background to make sure that this webinar is possible. We're hosting uh, our next webinar in the series a month from now on Friday, the 7th of May, with a session focused on the role of proteomics in dementia research. And this